Hi, I'm Mike Contos for Cardiosource. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Ben Sirica, a biomarker expert with the Timmy Group, who is currently an associate professor at Brigham and Women's Hospital. We will be discussing a relatively new marker, growth differentiation factor 15, and whether this will be the next new cardiac marker that we'll be using in clinical practice. Ben, can you tell us what growth differentiation factor or GDF 15 is? GDF-15 is part of the transforming growth uh, family factor that is in regular uh, healthy myocardium, not expressed very commonly, but in times of stress, whether it's ischemia, whether it's reperfusion, there is an upregulation of the expression of this protein uh, that then is sustained actually over uh, days and even weeks after the insult. Is it uh, somewhat analogous to CRP or BNP, or is it, what differences does it have from those other two markers? It is. It, uh, it has a couple different features that are differently. Uh, it tends to be um, something that's regulated within the myocardium and seems to stay expressed for longer than, for instance, the natriuretic peptides. The natriuretic peptides will get an acute hemodynamic stress. Um, and uh, may peak and then come down. C-reactive protein is actually produced predominantly probably not in the myocardium, but GDF-15, when, it uh, when it's stimulated by uh, injury, ischemia, or reperfusion, it will, um, it will be expressed and actually stay elevated for a much longer duration. So it has a bit of a, a ability to um, probably be part of the entire uh, remodeling phase after an acute injury. Do you think it's a better test for identifying long-term risk in patients with asymptomatic coronary disease, or is it more appropriate for the patient who we know has acute coronary syndrome? I think it, that really does get to the question of what you're using the test for and how specific it is for a, uh, uh, for the diagnosis that you're looking for, the prognosis that you're looking for. I think when we're talking about the acute coronary syndrome patient, we really are focusing on what's the risk associated with that particular injury. And so we're trying to identify what other markers can we find that identify a patient who is not going to do well based on that particular event. If we're looking at the asymptomatic patient, we may still be seeing some underlying pathology and pathophysiology which is expressed by the elevated levels of GDF-15, but it's harder to know what the, I think, the underlying uh, stimulus of that injury is um, uh, compared to the ACS patient, where we think it's very much likely due to the acute thrombus causing an acute ischemic episode. Because it may be elevated in patients with acute coronary syndrome, do you think it would be useful to screen patients who come in through the emergency department with chest pain to identify those who are currently having an ACS? Uh, is there any data that's looked at this particular marker in this patient population? It, it again, I think, is uh, focused, it, with your question is for diagnosis and, and prognosis. I think in terms of the diagnosis, um, like many of the other uh, tests that we've been looking at uh, in terms of diagnosis, it's very hard to beat cardiac troponin, especially the more sensitive cardiac troponins, um, in terms of the diagnosis and specificity uh, for myocardial necrosis. And so I don't see much future for it in that particular setting for the diagnosis of uh, of ACS or diagnosis of uh, MI um, because we have such a good marker in the troponin. Where I think it may be different and offer complementary information to troponin and to natriuretic peptides is when we're talking about the prognosis and the potential for therapeutic implications. It seems like almost every month we have a new marker that comes out. What's the best way for us to determine whether this one will actually be uh, useful in clinical practice long term? Well, it's a really good question, and you're right. You can't open a journal without seeing two or three different biomarker uh, papers, some of them on these novel markers. And I think a, a biomarker has to go through several stages before we would ever consider it ready for prime time, let alone something that we would want to give it a high indication for use. Uh, the first is that there has to be a, a way to measure it that is reproducible, um, that is uh, has good um, 
uh, good accuracy and, uh, and is relatively cheap. Um, but once you get beyond that, we have to make sure that it offers incremental information beyond what we have right now. Um, and I would say right now in acute coronary syndrome, we uh, have troponin for sure and definitely the natriuretic peptides. And so you want to show that it shows incremental benefit in the, uh, in the relationship between that marker and outcomes. And we typically look at that with simple uh, hazard ratios or odd ratios, um, differences or improvements in the C statistic when you add the new biomarker, or some of the uh, more recently described metrics like net reclassification index or, um, or IDI in terms of showing that it actually does show some incremental benefit. And that's just for prognosis where I think a biomarker can really have a difference in clinical practice is if you will do something different in your practice based on that biomarker. So that if it's elevated, that means you would give a particular drug or you would do a particular procedure. And troponin's by far the best example of where if somebody has an elevated troponin, we're more likely to bring them to catheterization rather than manage them conservatively. That's been a much uh, higher bar um, than just prognosis and one that many biomarkers, in fact, almost all, have not shown with the exception of troponin. So we're still waiting for more information before we could, we'll probably see this marker in general use. It is. I think we do need to see some more. There have been some really nice studies that have looked at it. Um, one from the Frisk investigators, one of the early ones, looked at GDF-15, and they did um, feel that there was uh, a benefit um, uh, of an invasive strategy versus conservative among patients with an elevated level of GDF-15. Um, another data set that, uh, where GDF-15 was examined was the PROVE-IT trial, which looked at atorvastatin um, 80 versus pravastatin 40 milligrams. And while GDF-15 showed a very good ability to identify patients at higher risk of death, MI, and heart failure, um, it didn't identify patients who would be more likely to benefit from receiving the intensive statin therapy. And so we don't have a clear treatment interaction in that sense. And I think there are going to be other places when you can imagine something like GDF-15 where it'd be interesting to look at. For instance, in patients with larger MIs, um, would early initiation of ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or the, uh, 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 or the aldosterone inhibitors, would they have a greater benefit in patients with elevated levels of GDF-15 where uh, they may have more injury um, uh, or more area at risk, which could uh, perhaps be salvaged and, um, and improve their outcomes over the long term. Well, Dr. Sirica, thank you so much for joining us today for that excellent discussion. For more information, please visit the biomarker community on cardiosource.org. Thank you.